All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week. We're actually recording this on Monday, but we're airing it on Tuesday. I've got Sam Vecini, one of the basketball minds in the world that I respect the most, someone who I learned a lot from, and someone who's super well-connected, helps me learn a lot more about some of the uh, uh, the way that the NBA works behind the scenes as well. <laughs> also a good friend of mine. I'm excited to d- dive into the NBA Finals with you, Sam. We have... Uh, to this point, not a whole lot to be optimistic about for Dallas. And I've spent a good amount of time over the course of the last couple of, uh, you know, four days or so explaining all the reasons why Boston is giving Dallas problems. But I kind of want to focus today uh, at more solutions based. Yeah. So let's start. Let, let's start with Boston on defense. I think the primary issue at this point is they're just really struggling to contain the basketball. But I also don't view it as a problem that's going away. I, I think they just have too many entry points between Gafford and Luca, and uh, uh, even like Kleba was struggling a little bit with some guys on the perimeter. Kyrie has been gambling in the post and giving up straight line drives as well. So I don't necessarily see a universe where Dallas suddenly just puts the clamps on Boston on the perimeter. So if you were coaching Dallas... What would you do on the defensive end to try to gain control of the situation with Boston? So, yeah, this is the side of the court where the solutions are really hard, I think. Uh, I think I can come up with some solutions on offense where I'm like, okay, I think these are okay. The the real problem for Dallas on defense is that Boston has been very intentional with its spacing, right? They are making sure that Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford are above the break basically at all times. Or if Chris Stops is in, they might have them like deep in the corner. And they're just making it so that those guys can't contest at the basket. Like Derek Lively has played what? Probably 35, 40 minutes in the series and has zero blocks because there's just he's not around the basket in those circumstances. So the idea here is to try and find a way to get their bigs around the basket a little bit more and bet on like shooting variants. In my opinion, like I would want to try and bet on, you know, last, last night, right. I think it was Kristaps, Sam Hauser, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown combined went two for 20 from the three point line. That's the kind of variance you need for it to be a, you know, what was it? It was a six point game with like a minute left, something like that. Yeah, Boston only had 105. Yeah, like uh, I think it was relatively okay, but it was okay not in terms of process. It was in terms of shooting variance, I thought, because Sam Hauser missed like four wide open threes and Kristaps missed a couple of open threes and Tatum missed an open three. Like wh- when Dallas fans like bring up the fact that, you know, oh, we also shot 23% from three, I'm just like, well, guys, they're leaving Josh Green and Derek Jones open for a reason. You aren't leaving Sam Hauser and Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown open for a reason. So I think the shooting variance gods are much more likely to be favorable to Boston even at this point. It feels like Boston has only shot well from three in like one quarter, maybe like a quarter and a half of this series. And it was the first quarter and a half. So I would look at going toward more of like a matchup zone based kind of scheme. They ran a possession of a kind of similar matchup zone situation. I want to say it was at like the nine 30 mark of the first quarter uh, against Boston. And I kind of liked the way it looked because they would like essentially pre switch any sort of screening action, keeping Gafford, around the basket a little bit more often. That would kind of be my idea. Go toward more of like a zony matchup based zone. And you might think zoning Boston is a terrible idea. I don't disagree. I just don't know that they have better options either. Yeah, that's kind of the way I look at it too, in the sense that at the very like what you're doing right now is not working. Yeah. And you know, z- zone at the very least serves to disrupt rhythm. Even if you just kind of alternate yeah. zone and away from zone at kind of random sequences, there's a couple things that they're doing that I really don't understand. Like one one thing is, I think they're applying their ball pressure a little too far out, okay. which is a it was which is a tr- a problem when you're struggling to contain the basketball in the sense that like like there was a play where. Drew Holiday's bringing the ball up the floor on the left side and PJ Washington's like picking him up like full court. And 
Drew ends up making like kind of like a spin move towards the sideline and he's a little out of control. But when you're that far away from the basket, you're not immediately ending up in bodies. You have an opportunity to regain control and kind of get your feet straight as you're kind of going downhill and making a play. So like part of it is I kind of would lean more on going more passive in the sense that not just not just in ball pressure, but also in isolation situations, giving ground, baiting, pull up jump shots yeah. rather than trying to pressure the basketball so much. I I like what you talked about with the pre switching too. I it's it's comical to me how easily they're allowing you know, know Gafford to end up on Tatum twenty five feet from the basket or Luca to end up that far away. You put you called it a matchup zone, and that's a great way to kind of look at it in the sense that. If you have guys out above the break who are essentially there to guard, and if Gafford's man runs up to sc- to to go set a screen or something like that, if you just let those guys solve that problem and just kind of rejigger the matchups behind them, you can figure out a way to kind of keep your uh, situation more favorable. But in general, I think cont- focusing more on contain rather than pressure. Yeah in the sense that it's almost like a more passive uh, version of defense. Because one of the things is like, we're so accustomed to Boston losing their head and playing a really silly brand of basketball. (laughs) And they just haven't done that in this series. There was a brief stretch spanning the end of the second quarter and early third in game one, where they went like five minutes of game clock where they didn't get a single touch in the paint where you're like, what are you guys doing? But aside from that, they've actually played like a grown-up basketball team. I, I got to credit Tatum and Brown. I think they've just done a really nice job yeah. of just understanding the assignment. I, I think Joe, Joe Mazzula talks about like the different phases of the drive, like don't try to hit a home run on the first drive. To me, that's like advantage creation versus advantage extending. Yeah. Like Your job is not to get an assist on the first drive. You just need to compromise the defense. And they've done a really good job of that. And so if you can get into a situation where you have more favorable matchups on Tatum and Brown and you focus more on contain, I think that serves to better bait Boston into their worst tendencies. But no matter what, they've got to do something. I I, I don't I don't understand a, a scenario where you just continue to let Luca kind of sit on an island. I don't think this is Harden and PG. Remember how like Harden and Paul George like Luca kind of sort of started to contain them a yeah. little bit in some moments. I don't think he's going to be able to do that about against Brown and Tatum. Do you? Well, he's a good matchup for Harden because Harden can't really blow by. Like he can just body up against Harden. Paul George is like a little bit more willing to settle from three than what Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are. Jalen and Jason, they're going to try and get downhill and get to the rim uh, at the end of the day. And a big piece of that is I think that Boston's again, like I brought up spacing earlier, it can't go unnoticed here right the fact that they have five guys on the court at all times who can shoot and not just shoot but are probably like 40 percent three-point shooters if you leave them open outside of maybe drew holiday but drew holiday hit 40 percent of his catch and shoot threes this year i think that Mm. it makes it a lot harder to kind of do what you're suggesting i'm not saying that you're wrong i think you are right that they need to play more conservatively but it makes it harder because the driving lanes are just wider, right? They're wider against Boston than they are against even like Oklahoma City or Cle- or uh, the Clippers, right? It just makes it way more difficult, I think, to contain those drives. Like Derek Jones Jr. is like pressuring Jalen Brown at the three-point line even, which is kind of what you have to do. And the lane to Jalen Brown's right is just so wide and his first step is so good that it almost doesn't matter. Right. Like I agree with you, like some of the like silly BS stuff that, you know, PJ Washington is doing right. Like I, the fact that he like keeps same side helping and doubling and like digging into guys handles on these drives is just driving me crazy. Like he had he had the one in game two where it was like a bounce pass out to Derek White and Derek White just like caught and like immediately gathered into a three. Like no dip, no yeah. dipped it. Mm-hmm. It was just like, well, come on. Like, what are we doing here? Also, they need to stop with like the scramble double team stuff that they've done, you know, sparingly in game one and game two. You know, I think they did a decent amount when they panicked in game one. And then there's another possession in game two, I believe, where PJ Washington did like a post to post double on, I think it was Tatum who got a mismatch. They've been doubling Tatum in the post a lot. I hate it. Yeah. You can't do it. He's too good of a passer. Boston is too good at keeping the advantage by rolling that ball around the perimeter. 
I truly think that you need to make Tatum just like a fadeaway post scorer at the end of the day in those circumstances, kind of like you're saying. Yeah, the the when you play solid positional defense against Tatum, where like you just keep your body in front, even though he will have his possessions in the game where he just goes right through you like a superstar and dunks it, he'll settle for you know two or three right shoulder fades and left shoulder fades as well. And mm-hmm. like they're doing this too, where it's like it'll be like Kyrie catches in the post against Tatum, and he'll just immediately overplay the high side, and then they'll zone up on the backside, and then Tatum will just make an easy bounce pass out of it. Like they're the the, the over aggression is crazy. The strong side corner help from PJ Washington in general, they were better in game two than they were in game one. But in general, through two games, I think they've over helped, which is yeah. part of it. I feel like is reprogramming yourself because Minnesota was the series where you wanted to over help, yeah. like that was how they beat you, and yeah. in so many ways to me this comes down to matchups like matchups have determined so much of the championship picture this year because Denver was ill-equipped to deal with what Minnesota brought defensively Minnesota was ill-equipped to deal with what Dallas brought defensively and Dallas is now ill-equipped for for Boston on both ends of the floor and and like again the I I like to, to bring it back to something you said at the beginning too if do what Boston's doing, like we're about to move to Boston on offense or defense. And I thought Joe Missoula's game plan has been literally brilliant. Yeah. And I can't say enough how, how much I've, I've appreciated just not just the, not just the game plan itself, but the execution of it through the first two games, but everything with Joe Missoula is about tilting Dallas's offense towards above the break threes for guys like Derek Jones Jr., P.J. Washington, Maxi Kleba, uh, Josh Green, you know, yeah. Dante X, some of these kinds of guys. And to your point, like, you got to lean into that with Boston, too, in the sense that you overplay the corners. And if Porzingis is going to take a bunch of above-the-break above threes or Horford's going to take a bunch of above-the-break above threes or even Jalen Brown, you kind of have to live with it to a certain extent with a contest, obviously. Yeah. You want to offer that contest because that's the other thing, too. Like, Boston's getting out on those guys. Yeah. They're just they're they're offering a contest after the fact. And so, like, I, I think you have to kind of choose the lesser of two evils and taking away the rim and taking away the corner – I think is the best pathway to them for them to try to play Boston towards their lowest shot quality. And then you pointed this out, but like Porzingis, I think he looked a little shaky in game two. Uh, Drew Holiday went uh, hit a couple of threes, but if he's above the break instead of in the corner, I think you you like those results a little bit better. So I think like trying to be smart about where you help from would go a long way. But to your point, like this is the end of the floor that I think Dallas has the fewest answers. Yeah. And and, I, and honestly, I don't I don't see a universe where they like just strangle this Boston offense. Agreed. And the worst part about it is this was the game you had to win. Boston got 0.75 points per jump shot yep. in game two. That's the one you have to win. Dallas actually outshot Boston on jump shots in game two. You had to get that one and you didn't get it. We're this close to crowning a new NBA champion, and with the action heating up on the court, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered every step of the way with same-game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Don't miss out as the NBA postseason winds down. It's super easy to get started with DraftKings if you're a first-timer. Try betting on something like a team to win. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your team, and place your first bet. It's that simple. The odds in the NBA Finals right now, you can get the Celtics to win at minus two. 210, or if you're into the underdog Dallas Mavericks, they're at plus 175. And if you're new to DraftKings, you got to check this out. New customers bet five bucks to get 150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code HOOPS. That's H O O P S. That's code HOOPS for new customers to get 150 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Moving over to the other side of the floor. Well, can, can Go we, ahead. Did you I have another I was going to say, like, maybe this will be the way to transition from that side of the court to this side of the court. A big problem for me has been just Derek White has been like, or uh, not Derek White, Derek Lively has been like completely ineffectual in this series, right? I am wondering if they should use some of those minutes that you're giving to li- Derek Lively and go small with like PJ Washington at the five and just see what happens. I don't think it could be worse because at the end of the day, like you're not getting the rim protection anyway. 
from Lively because they're just pulling them away from the basket. Now, like if they're going to play zone and adjust that way, great. Like I'm, I'm interested in seeing that playing more of a matchup zone. Like we talked about finding ways to get the rim protectors at the rim. If you're going to do that, great. Another option here could just be to try it out gun Boston at the end of the day and say, Hey, we're not getting the rim protection anyway. Let's try and go like full, you know, uh, being able to contain them on the perimeter on defense, just trying to stop them from getting to the rim. Derek Lively is not going to be better at that than our perimeter defenders are. And just try and go five out and go like PJ Washington at the five. You probably have to play Derek Jones still because Derek Jones is such a critical defender against Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. But then you play, you know, honestly, like I might dust off Tim Hardaway Jr. next to Kyrie and Luca and just try and outgun them and outshoot them and hope that Tim Hardaway catches fire while you're containing them on the perimeter a little bit. Tim makes it harder to contain them, but like you're you're just not getting anything from that center position anyway. And that's why I think it might be worth like transitioning, talking about this now when we transition from defense to offense. If you're able to space them out, I think that that would cause boston's defense particularly when christophs is on the court a little bit more stress than what we've seen so far no i think this is a really good take and i actually uh was talking about this with my buddy combo this morning i went on on his podcast and he actually presented this idea and i i find it fascinating in two ways because to your point yeah you're not getting any rim protection from Lively or Gafford because of the way they're setting up the floor. In addition to that, Boston's doing a pretty solid job of making decisions when they get to the rim. Their speed, their, and it doesn't matter how good Derek Jones is at containing the basketball if he's never on the ball because they're switching yeah. and ending up with Luca yeah. and just attacking through Luca. And so rotational speed becomes more valuable. So for instance, like a guy like Tim Hardaway Jr., if you put him on the ball, his value is pretty low. Yeah. But like, if you're asking him to sprint around in in rotation, as long as he's playing hard and, and understands where he's supposed to be next, he might be able to do that job at least to a certain extent. Yeah. Then that pushes us to the other end of the floor because you're right. Like to me, the number one factor that is disrupting Dallas's offense is Tatum on the center. Yeah. Because essentially, what's happening is. And it's not just that because Horford is switching onto Luca beautifully. In general, Jalen Brown's doing a great job on the ball. It's a team effort. I'm not trying to underestimate that. But the entire geometry of the way that that Denver or Dallas wants to attack in the half court with their pick and roll game is thrown off by the fact that Lively and Gafford are in the dunker spot rather than setting screens and rolling towards a vacant painted area. And so to me, like to your point, they need to try to mess with the spacing the same way that Boston has been. Yeah. And what that means is you need to make sure that you have above the break three point shooters above the break. So who are the guys for Dallas that I actually like shooting above the break threes? It's Kyrie. It's Luca. It's Tim Hardaway jr. And if there was one of the role guys that I feel most comfortable up there, it's probably Dante Exum, believe it or not. He actually hit one in game two, but he's just got a really good set shot where if he's got all day, yeah, I actually like him up there, but he's not a great option. But the point is, if you can find a way to set up the floor to where you have Derek Jones and PJ Washington in the corners and you don't have an occupied dunker spot, and you're running action up top with Tim Hardaway Jr. and Luca, just like ghost screens and stuff, and 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 Luca's compromising the defense and working with a vacant paint. I think that that serves to at least open things up for you on the offensive end of the floor. But the one problem I would have there is to this point in the series, Dallas has held up pretty well on the glass. As a matter of fact, it's 50-50 yeah. in rebound percentage through through the two games. I do worry about just the sheer athleticism advantage for Boston tilting in that sense and them starting to do a bunch of damage on the offensive glass. Do you think that that would be an issue? I don't know that it would be necessarily. I think it could be for sure, but like with how much they're spacing their bigs away from the rim... It would be an awful big ass for you to say, Kristaps, we need you to crush the offensive glass and then get all the way back on defense against Kyrie, who does tend to push the pace. Like if it was just Luca on the court, I think that would be a bit more of a concern. But when Kyrie is out there and Kyrie is willing to go a little bit more often, whereas Luca is going to slow it up a little bit more, I don't think they would crush them necessarily given how intentional they're being about their spacing with their bigs away from the rim right now particularly now 
the way that I felt Dallas got the advantage on Minnesota in that series was utilizing more double screen actions, double drags particularly, where you'd have Mike Conley be the guy having to guard that first ball screen defender or be the first ball screen defender, right? Because typically the way teams mm-hmm. that the way teams navigate those is they will switch the first one and then they will play drop in the second one, right? Especially Minnesota with Rudy Gobert, right? They want to be able to play switch and then drop. That ended up resulting in a lot of mismatches where Mike Conley was on Luka Doncic or Mike Conley was on Kyrie Irving coming off and that was able to create an advantage or when Minnesota started to adjust, it created a lot of communication errors, right? I have been surprised about the level to which Dallas has not really run as many double drags, double screen actions uh, in this series to this point. I would like to see more of them, I think. Now, who are you trying to attack? This kind of solves the problem that you were saying. I actually think that Jason Tatum has been incredible off the ball in this series. I sneaky Mm -hmm. think he's kind of been the one guy that you can get on the ball a little bit more often than what people think. I might try and get him switched on to Luca a little bit more often or switched particularly on to Kyrie a little bit more often to get him going and then try and make that work that way where like you have Chris stops in a drop. But again, to do this, man, it it gets hard though, because like then you have Chris stops and drop and he's probably going to out high point, uh, Daniel Gafford, but they caught Rudy in these circumstances too. So maybe this is it. Like maybe you just go, if you're still going to play big, you go with like a double drag at the top. You try and get Luca on, you're trying to get Jason Tatum on Luca and then you see how it goes. Yeah. I, I've noticed that too, where Luke, cause Luca was hunting uh, Tatum a lot in the first half of game two. And it's just the simple thing that Luca does to everybody. Once he gets that little bit of an angle on you, yeah. it's just over. Cause he's so damn big. The, I what I worry about with like the double screen action is especially when Horford's out there. I think Boston is just totally fine with Horford on Luca. Now, the the one thing that I've struggled to understand as it pertains to in the Porzingis lineups, why but, in the world have they not tried to go? Well, ahead. the Porzingis lineups are the ones that are killing them, though. Like the, if you take away mm-hmm. those lineups, like it's basically an even series so far. Hmm. Well, and it, so the specifically with Porzingis, I, and I've been so impressed by Porzingis defensively in the series, even on switches, I think he's done a pretty good job. Why? Because when you actually see Boston end up with Porzingis, whether it's a transition cross match or something, where Porzingis is on Lively or Gafford, you can actually see Dallas's offense click back into shape. The, like the, yeah. the big dunk that Derek Lively had uh, in the second half over Derek White. It was a, a miss, push and transition, cross match. Tatum ended up on Derek Jones in the right corner or left corner. They ran the ball screen, just easy a pocket pass to lively, lively dunks all over Derek White. Why hasn't, and I called for this after game one, and and, and maybe there, I, there has to be something I'm missing. Why hasn't Dallas tried a Ram screen yeah. to just get Tatum to concede the switch because and basically what I'm, what I'm looking at there is like just adding that. If you're going to, if you're going to let Boston guard your pick and roll three on three, meaning like you're going to let them have Tatum parked underneath the basket while you have Derek Jones, either trying to roll into all that traffic yeah. or pop above the break. Why not? Instead of having Gafford or lively, just stand there because they're not doing damage on the offensive glass. Neither team is really doing that much damage on the offensive glass. How do you keep him engaged? And to me, like what I would like to see and part of this is like, they got to get the ball up the floor quicker. Like they got to get up in into their offense quicker. But once they get up the floor, what I'd love to see is have PJ or Derek Jones Jr. Just run like sprint down and screen Tatum hard. And then as the screen is set, have Lively sprint up into the action. I think they'll concede the switch and let Porzingis run up into the ball screen. From there, I would literally turn around and turn it into stack, pick, and roll. And as Luka comes off the ball screen and Lively's rolling, I turn around and back screen Porzingis again. It just kind of adds some some confusion. Because to me, this is ending up in way too many ISOs. Like, in general, there's 
Very few roll man opportunities, very few spot up opportunities. I pulled this stat this morning. Through two games, 68 spot up opportunities for Boston, 28 That's crazy. for Dallas, yeah. according to, to Synergy. That's just insane. And and part of the reason is, is like because of the fact that that Boston has Tatum parked under the basket, they haven't needed to engage any of the corner defenders in yep. to guard the action. So those guys aren't getting open. And so like I I through two games, I haven't seen a single Ram screen. Am I like just screaming at uh at the ether here? Or do you think that that Boston would just switch all those things easily and shut it off. Like, what do you think is the reason why we haven't seen, to your point, the double drag, I think, falls into this list it does. too. Yeah, yeah. Why haven't we seen more complications in pick and roll to try to make yeah, this Yeah, and like you brought up like stack, Spain, ball screens too. Like that was literally going to be my next point. It's like, why haven't we seen too many of those? Like, it's just that they're making it so easy. The thing that I feel like they're doing most often when Kristaps is out there is they're just running like empty ball screens to try and just like make him guard in like a big ocean of space, basically. And that's where I'm glad that you brought up that you think he's done a pretty good job. They're just willing to concede like a lot of the times it's Derek White who ends up on Kristaps or it's one of the other wings or whatever. And they're just like willing to concede that three to those guys. And that ends up being a little bit too easy for them. So I completely agree with you. It requires much more screening and movement. I thought that what they ran early in the second quarter actually is kind of similar to what you're saying. It was a little bit different in terms of functionality, but they ran a set three straight times to start the second quarter where they essentially set a similar, it's not a Ram screen. It's just like a middle screen for Luca to come up and get the ball at the elbow essentially and the first time he got switched on to peyton pritchard and ended up shooting like a mid-range jumper over him and it was an easy shot and he drilled it the second one they ran a counter off of it where they had the screener come down screen for luca who then veered off to the right and then dante exum sprinted down and set like a second screen for luca to give him a wide open corner three i agree with you that i think engaging those defenders right around the basket with screening actions is a really, really good way to actually be able to try and get the matchups and the mismatches that you're kind of hoping for uh, in those circumstances, be it out of Ram screens or screen middle ball screens, just to get Luca the ball at the elbow or whatever you want to do, but completely 100% agree with you. And I think that running like a stack or Spain off of that, is even more lethal and I'm surprised that they haven't gone to it more. It really is just more. I am surprised that they have not run more like combo screen actions, basically to be able to try and get their guys free and to be able to force more communication within the Boston defense. I think they need to do an off ball too. Like, yeah. like if Gafford and lively are not catching lobs out of the dunker spot and they're not getting offensive rebounds out of the dunker spot, you need to have them running off ball screening actions. Yeah. Like it, 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 they just, at this point, what Boston has done is they've taken all of the strengths of your role players and they've just kind of reconfigured where they are on the floor to make it so that they're weaknesses. Yep. PJ Washington, great corner three point shooter. He's not getting corner three point looks. Uh, you know, D- Derek Jones Jr., great, uh, a good corner three point shooter, a good slasher of closeouts, but he's like, He's operating as a pick and roll roll man now, which is like a completely different kind of job for him. Lively and Gafford are these rim runners who are not running. They're stuck in the mud down in the dunker spot. And so in general, I just want to see so much more off ball screening action. And the main reason why is like, I do not think Dallas can beat Boston by ISOing them to death. I don't think this is... I don't think this is, you know, the 2016 Cavs where you're going to get like, yeah. you know, 40 a piece out of them. The rest. So I, I think the defensive personnel for Boston is too good. The, those those Cavs teams had matchups that they could attack. This is not that type of, of, of series. I think they've got to try to find a way to free some things up there. And again, like to me, it's it's just got to be more of of that kind of screening action. I did like that Lucas seemed to target the smaller guards more in yep. game two. They didn't. They scored a lot more in the post in game two than they did in game one. I thought Luca ran out of gas there towards the end as he missed those couple over over Pritchard that he normally makes. But like the, I don't think attacking Horford is an option. Horford is, you know, yeah. Horford is probably in my lifetime the best that I've seen of uh, like as a positional, just like read where you're going, beat you to the spot, take the contact, and make you yeah. shoot over the top. 
of any center I've seen, I think he's one of the best at that. I think that's why he did such a good job on Embiid over the years. I think that's why, like, the the big power players, he just guards so well. Yeah. And, like, every time Luka gets him on a switch, I just don't think that's an option. And so one of the things I liked about that sequence that you were talking about there in the start of the second quarter is kind of, like, targeting, like, instead of having Luka just hunt in – like ball screen switch, then work off the dribble, dribble 25 times, get him catches where he already is in a good strong position where it's yep. the job's a little bit easier. But no matter what, they're going to have to do more in terms of those screening actions to try to free things up. Um, what do you think, what, what's your just overall opinion of this series at this point with Boston up 2-0? How do you see things changing slash not changing as we go to Dallas? I don't see much changing because last night was like you kind of said the night that Dallas had to get it and the fact that those four guys I mentioned earlier Hauser Porzingis Tatum and Brown went two for 20 from three that just feels deeply troubling to me if I'm a Dallas fan like the fact that this game probably should have been a 20 point loss in my opinion like even while Dallas was up four I was texting with my podcast partner Bryce and we were just sitting there going this is going to be 10 before halftime. Like they're going to start shooting at some point. They're going to start making these shots and they never did. And they never really did throughout the course of the entire game outside of Drew Holiday, I think made two and Derek White made maybe four of 10, if I remember correctly. But like they shoot 26% from three. They're not going to shoot 26% from three again in all likelihood. Like, man, I, I don't, I don't know that we've come up with good enough solutions here to change the tenor of this series. Unfortunately, it's that's what we're trying. We're though. trying. <laughs> like I, I, I want, I want like there to be excitement. I would love for Dallas to come back and like Luca to go out and drop like a fifty point triple double. But I, I don't know, man. What do you think? Well, and then Boston is also just like a there. I do. I do think they're a better road team than they are a home team in large part because I think that there's something about the challenge on the road that keeps them more engaged. Yeah. I mean, I think they're a victim of their own talent in so many cases. I mean, both of their home losses in this playoff run were just absolute dud defensive efforts. Yeah. Like, I don't think we're going to see that sort of thing. I, I, let's just put it this way. What's more likely this series comes back to Boston 2-2 two, uh, two, two, or it's a sweep? I think a sweep is more likely... The thing that I will ask you, though, Kristaps didn't look super hot at the end of game two, right? Like he wasn't moving quite as fluidly is what we've seen. If he is, you know, unable to play 20 minutes in game three or, you know, if he, God forbid, he sits like nobody's rooting for that, but whatever. I actually do think that changes the series substantially. In terms of the matchups that Boston will be able to or Dallas will be able to get on the defensive side of the court whenever Al Horford is out. And again, the Porzingis minutes are the ones that are killing Dallas right now because th those are the minutes where Boston is like five out, extremely well spaced. You can't help off of anybody like from anywhere. If Porzingis was to miss time, I do think that genuinely changes the entire schematics of what we're talking about here and like really would change the series drastically. Well, to put it simply, if Cornette was out there, it would just be a disaster. If yeah. I was Boston, I'd probably even look to go small no, if that were too. to happen just because, you know, because Dallas hasn't been able to capitalize on size mismatches in this series. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's the one wrinkle is the, is the Porzingis injury piece of it. And, and even then, even then I think I'd probably lean Boston but yeah, that's the that's the one wrinkle I look at. I agree with you. I think it's far more likely this is a sweep than two yeah. two coming back to 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 Boston. the The problem is is like the the game plan is the game plan. Like, I don't think Joe Missoula is going to overreact if if uh, Derek Jones and PJ Washington hit seven above the break threes in game three. But, the game plan is the game plan. The quality opportunities aren't going to be. You there. know what's amazing about that? This was exactly what Oklahoma City wanted to do. This is exactly <laughs> what their strategy was. We're going to let Derek Jones and PJ Washington beat us. 
<laughs> and I think that Boston is executing it better, particularly in terms of the corners, right? They're denying them the corners. Yeah, the co- I, I remember more corner, th- corner threes. Yeah. Which is the key. And I actually think that's a really, really important point that you made earlier, that they're denying them the spots that they want to shoot threes. But man, it is a little bit funny that like everyone like roasted Oklahoma City a little bit for just being like, we're going to leave P.J. Washington open. And now here... Boston is basically executing the strategy of leaving PJ Washington open and it's working. <laughs> Dude, I felt so confident that Oklahoma City was going to lose. Uh, uh, I picked against them in that series, but I felt very confident they were going to lose in the first two rounds and they did. But I left that playoff run being so much higher on Oklahoma yeah. City for next year. Like they're, 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 <laughs> they're nasty. They're mean. They're physical. Yeah. Lou Dort is just a, is like such a weapon. I, I, I love that Oklahoma city team. All right. So we have two more quick things I want to hit before we get out of here. One, you had texted me about a question you wanted to ask I do. surrounding this series. Okay. So I, I'm pulling it up right now. I want to get it like that on it. Do you have an overarching big takeaway from this playoff run in terms of if you were building a team for next year's title picture, is there something you would be looking at from an overall schematics perspective that you see as a potential, you know, point of attack or like something that is exceptionally valuable or a marginal advantage beyond just like having superstars, right? Because if anything, I think what, you know, this series has shown us and this playoffs has shown us is it doesn't take one of the top three guys in the league to win a title right now with how the NBA is. So is there a schematic marginal advantage or like a roster construction marginal advantage that you're looking at? You're taking away from this playoffs to take forward into the future. Okay. So I've been thinking a lot about this. First of all, the the last bit there, I do generally think you need a top three player. I think Jokic was, I think Steph was, I think Giannis was, I think LeBron was, I think Kawhi was, I I think, I think this, I think this is five $30 million players on one team. I I think that's what Boston is. So I, I I do, but from the schematic angle, I, I do think that five out is a more resilient offense than four out in the sense that like, just one simple matchup tweak. Just let's put our centers on bad above the break three point shooters. And let's put uh, Tatum on the center has like completely crumbled Dallas's offense in so many different ways. Whereas like when you run a five out attack, there are just so many different angles that you can work in so many different ways. You can reconfigure spots on the floor to make things work. Whereas like if you're a spread pick and roll four out one in team, it just is it just is difficult. And so I do think from a I do think from a stylistic standpoint, I think teams have to have a five out look. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that we I think we'll see Luca in a five out offense before too long here in the next few years. I think that there will be a team that tries to put him in that in that type of situation. That said, though, the reason why I've struggled so much with this question, because in in full transparency, Sam did text me this I question yeah. so I could think about it. Denver is so different from this Boston team in so many different ways. Yeah, the yeah. even even just the difference between like like play finishers versus like do it all guys like to me KCP and Michael Porter Jr. and Aaron Gordon are play finishers. They can operate in a five out offense, but like we saw in the Minnesota series how how much Denver struggled as soon as they solved the Jamal and Jokic. Like it just yep. it just kind of crumbled from there, right? Like I I I, I think that. I think that in general, you've got to build a a roster base or you've got to build a game plan based on what your roster is. So for instance, like to Missoula's credit, he really has kind of maximized this group offensively in so many different ways by getting them to buy into drive and kick. But at the end of the day, if I had to pick one thing, it'd be versatility of play style on both ends of the floor. Yeah. I think that inevitably, like the Eastern Conference was really easy this year because there were five good teams and four of them ended up on one side of the bracket and they all beat the heck out of each other and got hurt. And then Boston had the other three bad teams and they they got out of it. But I do think the East is going to be tougher in the future. I think Orlando is going to be tougher. I think teams are going to enter into that picture. So in general... We saw this in the West. We just talked about it at the beginning of the show. The matchup, uh, like the matchup resiliency as you're working through the conference. 
I think you've got to be able to beat different types of teams along the way. And so I do think you have to be like, I think you have to be able to uh, defend in a deep drop and in a high drop. I think you got to have a zone look. I think you got to be able to have some guys that can hold up on switches. I think on the offensive end of the floor, I think you have to be able to play out of the post. I think you have to be able to play out of pick and roll. I think you have to be able to match up hunt in isolation. I think there's a certain like variety that you need to have. Because I don't think this Dallas team was the best basketball team in the Western Conference, personally. I think Denver was. But I think Denver caught a really difficult matchup, and then that team had a really bad time with Dallas. And I would argue that both Minnesota and Denver would have fared better against Boston than Dallas did. Would you agree there? So, yes, I do. But it, like what you're saying, though, is actually why I was higher on Dallas than most people were You know, when we did our like championship tier grades at the deadline. And I said I'd bought Dallas in the top five. It's exactly that. It's because I thought that they had different ways to stop different things, right? And now against Boston, Boston is just like this whole different beast that they just didn't have the answer to this test. But I thought Dallas had more answers to the test than most other teams. It's just like in Denver's case, right? Like Denver, probably I think Denver probably beats Dallas for what it's worth. But like, I think that I do too. Denver's answer to the test is like just better than everybody else, right? Like on some level, it's just that Minnesota is built to stop that single thing, right? Which is great. The the two things that stand out to me are spacing on offense and ground coverage on defense. Uh, having that five out spacing look, which you kind of emphasized, I don't really need to go into that. You, I think broke it down perfectly ground coverage on defense is what Minnesota had. I think it's what Boston has. I think it's what Dallas has as well with those lively lineups, being able to cut off the court and cut off like large swaths of the court right now is like by far the most important thing that you can do. Uh, Even when their guys are getting beaten off the bounce in this series, having that ground coverage, being able to rotate around is at least giving them a chance on some level, but that's kind of where I'm at. It's ground coverage on defense, long athletes, you know, shooting on offense. And a lot of the times it's hard to find those two things in a single player package, which is what makes well, to things your, so difficult. To your point, if Derek Jones and PJ Washington were good above the break three point shooters, this is a totally different series. 100%. Like, like they, the pro that I can't tell you how often I'm seeing on the, on these, it, when I'm doing my film sessions, because Luca's kind of got his defender in jail and he's working downhill, the entire above the break line is either empty yeah. or Derek Jones is up there yeah. or Josh Green is up but, there. So here, here's, and like, and that's the thing they're not, they're making themselves easy to guard because they, they're not occupying that side of the floor with the threat. But, but here's the piece of that that makes it really hard. And this is why building a team is so exceptionally difficult, right? If Derek Jones is a good above the break three point shooter, you couldn't have gotten him for the minimum, right? He's, like, a, he's, he's a, a $20 million, million dollar player <laughs> and he's going to be like a $12 million player this year. So like, That's what, (laughs) that's what makes this really hard. If you're a team builder, right? If you're a GM, like having, this is what has made Brad Stevens so good at his job, right? Like he has gone out and paid the price to be able to go get the guys that make his scheme, uh, the scheme that Boston wants to build so functional. Well, and again, like anybody could have had those guys and Brad went out and got them, you know, to, to, to his credit. Uh, Sam, before we get you out of here, I'm just going to tee you up for a quick monologue. What was your takeaway on the Dan Hurley news this morning? Yeah. So my takeaway is I was very impressed that there were no leaks and that everybody did not know the way this was going to go. Like you should have seen my text messages. It was hysterical. (laughs) Like everyone was asking me like, what's he going to do? Like, what do you think is going to happen? And I would just be like, I don't know. I, my answer was, I thought 55, 45, he stays at Connecticut. If you, if you would have asked me the night that the story broke, I would have said 60, 40 goes to the Lakers. And I thought the, like the further along it went, the more likely it was that he would stay at UConn. Um, but it, the fact that it was that close and that like nobody knew, like I talked to, I, I don't want to put this person on blast. Like one of the premier college basketball insiders last night or this morning, your time. And he goes, yeah, I think I'd say 55, 45, he goes. So a was really impressed that like none of this got out because typically it gets out in some way, shape or form B. I have no idea why the Lakers only offered six seventy 
if you're going out and trying to get Danny Hurley, uh, that's just not a good enough offer point blank with the way that like the coaching market has inflated over the course of the last five years or really over the course of the last 12 months uh, at the end of the day, Steve Kerr is making 17. I think Greg Popovich is making like 18 or so. Uh, Budenholz is making 10 a year. I mean, come on. Right. Like if you really believe in Danny Hurley, you have to go and make it so (laughs) that he's turning down. Like, I'm not saying you have to offer him like five years, 140 or whatever it is, but like, you probably have to offer him five years, 80. You probably have to offer him 16 a year. You have to give him the Monty Williams offer at least, right? So that leads me to my next question, which is how worried were they that Danny Hurley was serious maybe and that they were inflating their own coaching market potentially by having that offer get out there? Uh, saying you were willing to pay 670 for a guy that you know has never won an NBA game, so... You know, let's say it's JJ Redick. I don't know if it's going to be JJ Redick. You know, I'm, yeah, I don't know if it's going to be JJ Redick or not. I'm like, hearing Borrego noise. Are you hearing that too? Uh, I have heard a lot of different things to the point where m- my impression has been this entire time that there they were undergoing a process that there was no decision that was made that there was no like like the, very grown up of them yeah like i felt like they were undertaking a process was the whole thing uh that there was never never certainty that it was going to be jj never certainty that it was going to be borrego like they were really trying to go down the road and explore everything that was available to them and they never made any choices now may, maybe that was it maybe they're trying to make sure that their market was not so overinflated that you know they have to pay James Borrego, you know, 9 million dollars a year now because you offer Danny Hurley 11.6 or something. I don't know. I, I think if you're chasing Danny Hurley, you just have to chase him and say like screw it, we're going balls to the wall here and we're trying to get the guy we want and to me, in my opinion, I know it was 20 million dollars more than the Connecticut offer, but 6 years, 70 million is not a good enough offer given the current market of NBA coaches. Yeah, Colin had dropped to me last night on the show that he had heard a much lower number than the $100 million number that was getting thrown around. Yeah. And that was where I started to get a little bit worried because uh, Colin's really connected, obviously, in the LA area. And I-, I felt the same way. My thing was like, especially like in the grand scheme of the television deal that's coming around, in the grand scheme of what your luxury tax bill is, what's $15 million a year right. for a coach that could be a culture setter? Like, I... I really struggled with that. Uh, I I will say that um, it wouldn't have been a perfect fit. I think that asking a year 22 LeBron to be held accountable by someone like Danny Hurley would have presented some challenges. I'm sure that, but I, I thought, especially like Dan's ability to create space with non-shooters yeah. on the floor, I thought that would have been a wonderful fit with Vanderbilt and Anthony Davis. I was so, so optimistic about it but at the same time like i just had this underlying ominous the lakers find a way to botch stuff like this typically kind of thing and that 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 tempered any sort of uh uh of uh, over excitement on my part you know what i'll say on the lebron front though is like everybody around the league will tell you that like if lebron like really respects the guy who's in charge and like really believes in him he has no problem being coached hard like he's like totally fine with like, Hey, like, I mean, look, like he might not want Danny Hurley, like getting his face and like F bombing him, which might've happened at some point. Like we just need to be realistic about that. But like, Le- I think LeBron gets this rap as like a coach killer, right? Like throughout his career. And I think as long as he respects the guy and it seems like he would have been going into this relationship with like a real degree of respect for Danny Hurley. He's fine from what I know, like being able to like, you know, take that, right? Like he'll, he'll, he'll respond to that from what I know. So, you know, whether or not there's another coach out there on the market that would be able to coax that out of him, I don't know necessarily, but you know, I, I do think that is a bit of a misconception about LeBron. Not that you're saying that like he was you know going to be a problem, but I, I do think that there's a little bit more to LeBron than what, uh, than what the current overarching philosophy is that I get in my Twitter mentions every night, unfortunately. 
No, I totally agree. Well, the thing too is like it, it's not David Blatt. He's not coming over from Europe. Right. There's something you know. There's something about like the the domestic dominance well, of of UConn that I think would resonate. 100. Like I had somebody ask me like, why is this different than David Blatt? David Blatt won multiple Euro League championships. I was like, you think 28 year old LeBron was watching the Euro League like every night? Like exactly. he's definitely watching Connecticut and watching the NCAA tournament and seeing what that looks like. He's not watching Euro League every night. He's not staying up until 2 a.m. in the morning to watch like Osvell versus Red Star. You know what I mean? So, hmm. yeah, no, it's um, it, it's it's interesting. Look, I mean, shout out to Andy Hurley saying it. Connecticut, you know, stay where you're happy. I'm a big, big proponent. I live in Melbourne, Australia, because uh you know, be where you're happy, you're happy at the end there. of the day. That's it. So uh, I respect Danny Hurley's choice in that respect. I'm just sad because I thought he could have turned that organization around. All right. That's all we have time for today. Sam, I sincerely appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on. I need to call you soon so that we can catch up. And then we also need to uh, take more time to talk more this summer on the show. I'm sure we'll find some time to do that. I'm hoping to see you out at summer league as well. Before we get you out of here, can you shout out what you're working on? On your end. So NBA draft guide. I wrote far too many words for the NBA draft guide. Um, it's going to be over 150,000 words on 75 draft prospects this year. Uh, that will be up next week at some point over at the athletic and then go to the game theory podcast over on YouTube, over on whatever podcasting platform you use. And you'll be able to kind of hang out with us every, you know, second night, whenever we go live. That's a perfect excuse to get you back on because I don't pay any attention to the draft until after the NBA Finals. So maybe we'll, we'll get you on at that point. Yeah. All right, guys, that is all we have for today. As always, we sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. I will be back with Colin Coward on Wednesday night after the final buzzer of Game 3. I will see you guys then. <laughs>